What's up, Crossroads? How are you all today? Good? You all have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, awesome. Hey, my name's Caleb Baumgartner. I'm the youth minister here. If I have not gotten the chance to meet you, I would love to meet you today after service. I'll be down front along with some of the elders. And if you would come on down, that would be awesome. Or if you need prayer today or have any questions, feel free to meet us down front after service. As Steve mentioned last week, I'm talking about having an attitude of gratitude today. As a youth minister, one thing I'm extremely grateful for is kids. I love that God has called me into a ministry where I have the opportunity to watch kids uh, mature, to figure things out in life, and to give their life over to Christ. I love to be able to be with kids and their naive approach to life, yet their ambitious, um, uh, ambitious goals they have in life, as long as there's zeal to conquer anything. One of the other things I am extremely grateful for is their flat-out honesty, which can be quite comical at times. If you are a parent or a teacher or aunt and uncle, a neighbor, or maybe just a YouTube peruser, I'm sure we've all encountered a time where a kid was totally honest and it was completely comical as well. Oftentimes this happens in prayer. Nick, our worship leader, was telling us a time when Violet, their oldest, was praying to the God of the universe, the God who has created all things in this world, giving him multiple choice demands. See, she was having bad dreams at night, and one evening she prayed to God and she said, dear God, here are your options, good dreams or no dreams at all, amen. Um, some other funny uh, prayers I've encountered over time is, dear God, did you mean for giraffes to look that way or was that an accident? <laughs> dear God, are you a ninja? Is that why we can't see you? Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel wouldn't have killed each other if they had their own room. It works for me and my brother. <laughs> some prayers that kids pray uh, are totally honest and sometimes they say exactly what we are thinking as adults as well. For instance, Joyce once prayed, Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but that is not what I prayed for. I asked for a puppy. <laughs> Peter, Peter once uh, prayed, Dear God, send Dennis Clark to another camp this year. I cannot stand him. And in light of Thanksgiving, just being a couple days ago, a little boy was asked to pray uh, by his father for their Thanksgiving meal. While the whole family was sitting there waiting, the boy eyed every single dish that his mother had prepared. After the examination, he bowed his head and he began to pray. Dear God, I do not like the looks of this meal. There are a lot of gross things on this table, but thank you anyways, and I guess I'll eat it. Amen. <laughs> you know, this morning as we sit here, I wonder if you guys have ever felt like that. Not this feeling of disgust over what you have to eat, but this feeling that you should be thankful for everything in you, that you have in life, but that's not what you really want. You've become ambivalent to life. You look at the table in front of you and you go, I do not like the looks of this. I mean, there's some good things here, but there's also some bad things like cranberry sauce. Who even likes that stuff? <clears throat> and maybe the reason you look at this table of life, not entirely, entirely grateful, is because maybe life didn't pan out the way you were hoping for. Maybe you didn't get the job you hoped to have. Maybe you didn't get the house you dreamed of. Maybe your marriage has become a little more difficult than you thought. You didn't think you would have all the struggles. Maybe you've lost a job or a spouse or a family member along the way. Maybe you've gotten health problems that you didn't want and expect, uh, and especially didn't expect, and it's altered your course of life. Maybe you've struggled with things like depression, anxiety, loneliness, pride, anger, addictions. Maybe you've always tried to be perfect, or you've struggled with comparison. And every morning when you wake up and you get on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, you look at it and you go, man, I'm glad my life isn't like them. Or you think, man, I wish my life was like them. And then as you get ready, um, you look in the mirror and you go, man, look at my body. It's perfect. <laughs> or <laughs> definitely not saying that about me. Anyway, uh, or, or you look um, in your, at the mirror and you nitpick your imperfections. Maybe it's guilt. 
for the things you've done, the stuff you've said, or the misarranged priorities that you have, and they've affected other people's lives. Maybe it's the way you parented, and you regret the, what, the decisions you've made. You wish you could go back and change things that have already been done. Maybe it's jealousy, or envy over the friends that you have in life for the houses you don't have, the toys you don't own, or the marriage or family you don't possess. And as you sit here this morning, as we talk about gratitude, how would you define it? Is your definition based upon the external circumstantial events in your life or something else? Because gratitude is much more than that. It's an attitude. It's a disposition. It's our manner that comes from within. This morning, we're going to be looking at two passages of Scripture that help us kind of define what gratitude is and then look at a man who, despite his external circumstances, possessed an attitude of gratitude. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke 17. Uh, you can pull it up on your phone, or if you don't have a Bible or are new to all of this, the Scripture will be up on the screen uh, behind us because we want everybody in here to, to study God's Word together. And in Luke 17, starting in verse 11, Jesus is traveling with his disciples. They're on their way to Jerusalem, and they're crossing the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as they enter this village, 10 men, all lepers, shout to uh, Jesus from afar. They say, uh, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, Jesus says, go, show yourself to the priest. If you were like me the first time I read this passage of scripture, I had no clue what was going on. And here's what's going on. During that time, there's clean and unclean people. Lepers were a group of unclean people. And what would happen is uh, those who had leprosy, it wasn't like today, like Hansen's disease, like we think of it. It was something along the lines of burns, impetigo, vitiligo, infections, eczema, scabies, MRSA. It could be on your clothes or in your home with like mold or mildew or a fungus or dry rot. And if somebody was thought to have leprosy, they were brought to the priest and the priest would examine them. And if it classified uh, with what Leviticus 13 said, they would be quarantined for seven days. And at the end of those seven days, if everything cleared up, they were considered clean. But if not, if things had spread or gotten worse, they were quarantined for another seven days. If it didn't spread again, they were fine. But if it uh, got worse and there was exposed skin, they were considered a leper, an outcast from society. They weren't allowed to be with everybody else who was considered clean, with their families and friends. And this might seem like a harsh rule that God would give, but you need to understand that God's protecting his people. It's the same reason why Deuteronomy 23 tells them, hey, don't poop in your camp. They didn't understand why, but God knew that it would protect his people. He wanted to keep them safe, so he gives them these laws. And, and the understanding of why these people did these things didn't come for hundreds of thousands of years. So these lepers were, were off. They're on the other side of the road because they weren't allowed to be on the same side. They weren't allowed to uh, talk with other people. They had to shout from afar, hey, leper coming. So they show themselves to the priests. They go off to do this because he's the only one that can officially make them clean again. And as they went, and while they were still on their way, they became clean. And one of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned back and he came uh, to God. He shouted his grat gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful he couldn't thank him enough. And he was a Samaritan, an outcast of outcasts in the Jewish culture. And Jesus said, we're not 10 healed. Where are the other nine? Could none of them find, uh, f be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, get up on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. We have no clue why the other nine didn't return. 
Maybe they continued on to the priest to officially make them clean again. Maybe they thought like, oh, I'm healed, I'm clean, I'm gonna go see my family. I haven't held my kids in years or indulge in an activity they had been exiled from. Maybe they were too self-centered and arrogant to give gratitude towards God. Maybe they were just lazy. They didn't wanna travel back where they had come from. They just thought, hey, Jesus makes his round. I'll, I'll just see him next time he comes by. Whatever it was, there's only one person that returns. And he comes back to God. And this story, even though this short passage of scripture, it shows us a sad truth. And the truth is, as humans, it's easy for us to receive a blessing in our lives without ever stopping and offering up thanksgiving to him. That's because gratitude is a choice. It's up to us whether or not we will be grateful or ungrateful for the things that we have in life. And not only is, a grat is gratitude a choice, but it will draw us closer to God. We can see this in the story of the Samaritan leper who comes back and he falls before God with, with gratitude, with thanksgiving for what he has done. When we choose gratitude in our life, we will draw closer to God. We will look more and more like his character every single day. For example... Let's say I choose gratitude in the morning when I wake up. Here's how my day would look. I would roll over in bed and I'd be like, dang, look at my wife. God, you are so good. And then I would move on to my child and, I would, and she would give me this good morning smile and I would just say, God, thank you for such a blessing. And then I'd move on to a shower where I'm grateful that I have instant hot water, indoor plumbing, I have a fridge full of food, I have clean clothes to wear for the day. And I look outside and it's pouring down rain and I go, God, thank you for the rain so plants can grow, so they can make this world a more beautiful place. And I thank God that I have a vehicle so I don't have to walk to work in the rain. And when I get to work, I'm, I'm grateful because I've been blessed with such an incredible job where I get to work here at Crossroads and work with all of you who are incredible people, where I get to work with incredible coworkers, where I'm joyful for laughter, where I'm joyful for the people I get to encounter throughout the day. I'm grateful that I get to converse with people, to share the gospel with people, to counsel people toward Christ's likeness. And as I get home in the evening, I thank God yet again for food, for the blessing of the, my family. And as I lay my head down at night, I pray to God. I say, God, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for letting me be a part of your kingdom and your plans. Or I could choose a life of ingratitude, of un ungratefulness. And it would look something like this. I'd roll over in bed and I'd be like, Amanda, Quit taking the covers. Like, seriously, quit snoring. Quit taking the covers. I'd be frustrated. And then I'd get up and I'd go, I'm tired of this child. Will they just be quiet and stop crying? I move on to my shower where I'm uh, frustrated because the water isn't warming up quick enough. I go to grab something to eat and I'm mad because there isn't the food that I want in the fridge. I look outside and see rain and I'm annoyed that I'm gonna have to wear a rain jacket or carry an umbrella everywhere I go. I get angry on the way to work because someone's driving five miles an hour under the speed limit. I grumble when I'm here because of the things I have to get done, the problems that arise and the people who drop in uh, and deter me from my daily work. As I get home that evening, I complain because my wife didn't make what I wanted for dinner. Maybe somebody was riding my tail on the way home. I'm annoyed that the baby won't stop crying and as I lay down my head at night, I pray to God, God, please don't let tomorrow be like today. Which one of those does your life look like? Are you choosing a life that draws you closer to God or pushes him away? And if you don't believe me, these little decisions that we make of ungratefulness can affect you and those around you. Have you ever had a piece of sand in your wet shoes or between your toes? It's annoying and over time, it's it just a little irritating, but the longer you walk, it rubs a blister on your foot. At first, being ungrateful doesn't seem like a big deal. But over time, the more ungratefulness that we have, it creates a life that is of ungratefulness, and it creates a bigger problem within us. 
Romans 1.21, I shared this passage last time I spoke as a verse that really spoke to me and kind of changed my life. And it says this, for although they, the Romans, knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They did not show God gratitude. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Church, this doesn't just happen overnight. They continually chose a life of ungratefulness. And as a result, we turn down to verse 29 and we read that they looked like this. They were filled with an all manner of unrighteousness, of evil, of covetousness, of malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Let me ask, does that sound like a group of people who's drawing close to God with gratitude? See, gratitude is not only a choice. We must choose every single day. It must exist in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The word will in the Greek is telema, which means God's desire, his wish, his purpose, his intent. So as we read this passage of scripture, in part, we could say that God's will, his intent for our lives is to give thanks in all circumstances. That's because to truly possess an attitude of gratitude, it must exist in all circumstances, which is a lot easier said than done. How do we possess an attitude of gratitude in all circumstances? How do we possess gratitude when our children are complaining, the dog is barking, it's pouring down rain outside, the vehicle broke down, the water heater blew up, a tree fell out on the house, maybe you burnt your Thanksgiving meal, uh, the family dog or cat passed away, you got passed on a job promotion, maybe you lost a job, you filed for bankruptcy, your house is being repossessed, your new car got totaled, you have no friends, uh, your uh, loved ones have passed away, maybe you got diagnosed with a terminal disease, Maybe you got put in jail. Uh, maybe somebody makes fun of you for your faith. Whatever it might be that brings fear and grumbling and anger toward God, how do you possess gratitude in those circumstances? By shifting your focus away from the external circumstances and shifting them toward Christ. Because gratitude, like I said earlier, isn't defined by our external circumstances. It isn't caused by the events that take place in our life, but is caused by one event, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we move our focus toward that, there's nothing in our life that can ever take away our gratitude. John Bloom a staff writer at DesiringGod.org wrote this in pertaining to Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. Jesus is in the upper room and he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. The word Jesus uses for thanks is euharisteo, the root word uh, hiero meaning grace, and Jesus took this bread, he saw it as grace, he saw it as a gift, and he gave thanks. But the word can also mean joy. So when you think for a moment about what Jesus thanks, euharisteo, meant, Jesus is saying this as John Bloom, I quote, Thank you, Father, for my body symbolized by this bread is about to be brutally broken and I'm about to be momentarily condemned by your wrath so that you will receive supreme glory in being able to forgive undeserving sinners. And I will share uh, eternally full joy with hundreds of millions of forgiven sinners made righteous through my sacrifice. Jesus was about, uh, Jesus was not, <clears throat> sorry, Jesus's thanks was not based upon his circumstance. Jesus was about to endure one of the most horrific things we could ever imagine, yet he felt thankful to the Father for the grace and the glory that was coming because of the cross. And this gave him joy. Euharisteo. Christ was able to possess gratitude 
to have joy while going to the cross. Because his focus wasn't on the event that was about to take place, but on the hope that was to come, on the grace that has been made to every single person in this world. And this gave him joy. His hope was on the future. And as long as our hope as followers of Christ, our focus is on the promises of God, on Jesus Christ. There's nothing, there's no event in our life that take, will take place that will triumph over the promises of God. And as Clint Bayers writes in his book, God says yes, there's hundreds, and depending on how you count them, thousands of promises that God has given to us, and he has kept all of them. And I don't know about you, but there's no one in my life who has made thousands of promises and has kept them all. So I stand with confidence in Christ and on the promises of the hope, of the hope of one day seeing fellow believers again in heaven, the hope of shedding no more tears, the hope of no longer possessing a terminal disease, the hope of no more sleepless nights, the hope of no more financial burdens, of broken down cars, of death or burnt Thanksgiving meals. And as long as our focus is on the cross, there's nothing that can take place in our life. There's nothing that will ever triumph over the cross and the promises that are to come. And as long as we choose to have an attitude of gratitude for the blessings that God has given us, and we choose to focus on Christ and Christ alone, there's no event in our life that will take away our gratefulness. Therefore, we possess gratitude in all circumstances. And in Genesis 37 through 50, we read about a man who despite his external circumstances, always possessed an attitude of gratitude. The man, is, his name is Joseph. And see, Joseph was the son of Jacob, a son of Jacob, and he was the favorited son of Jacob. And Jacob gave Joseph a coat of multi-color robe. And Joseph's, or Jacob's other sons hated Joseph. It says they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And one day as Joseph was out, they conspired to, to kill him. And Reuben, one of the brothers, steps in and he says, hey, let's not do that. Let's just throw him into the pit and let nature decide what to do with him. So they strip him of his robe and they throw him into a pit. They leave. And they begin to conspire and they talk like, hey, why don't we sell him into slavery to the Ishmaelites? However, while they're away, some Midianites come by. They draw Joseph up out of a pit. They um, take him and they put him into slavery and they sell him to the Ishmaelites. And Joseph ends up getting sold to Potiphar. He's in command over the Egyptian army. He moves down to Egypt. And while there, it says that God blessed everything that Joseph touched. He ends up becoming overseer of Potiphar's home. He does an incredible job. But it says, Scripture, scripture says that he was a good-looking dude, and Potiphar's wife wanted him. She wanted to lie with him. And he wasn't going to have that. He said, hey, I'm not going to betray my master. My master has done incredible things, He's, um, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. So one day as he's passing by, she grabs him by his loincloth, his underwear, um, probably all that he would have had on at that time, and she says, hey, come lie with me. And the dude takes off running. He just sprints out of there so fast that he leaves the loincloth in her hand, runs out completely naked. And Potiphar's wife shouts out like, oh, look at this Hebrew. He's come trying to lay with me. Potiphar gets word of this and he sends him to the king's prison, Pharaoh's prison. And while he's in prison, it says that God continued to bless him. He does an incredible job. He becomes over all of the inmates in prison. And one day the Pharaoh gets mad at his chief cupbearer and chief baker and sends him down to prison. And both of them have a dream and Jesus interprets the dream for them. And he tells the chief cupbearer, hey, when you are restored back to your position, don't forget me down here. But he forgets him. And for another two years, Joseph remains in prison. And then one day, Pharaoh has a dream. And Joseph, or the cupbearer remembers like, 
oh yeah, there's that guy down in prison. I was supposed to get him out. Hey, Pharaoh, there's a guy in prison who can interpret dreams. And he goes down. Pharaoh draws him out of the pit of prison. And he tells him his dream. And Joseph says, hey, here's what's going to happen. For the next seven years, you're going to have an abundance of crops. And for the next seven years after that, there's going to be a famine in all of the land. Here's what we should do. We should store up all that we can for the next seven years so we can survive the next. And Pharaoh, because God revealed the, the interpretation of the dream through Joseph, appoints him in charge of all of this. Joseph becomes in charge of all of Pharaoh's land. He gets a new name. He gets a wife and he becomes second in command to the Pharaoh. He's vice president. And after about six years of being in the Pharaoh's prison or be, working for the Pharaoh, he has two sons, one named Manasseh, which meant God has made me forget all of my hardships and all of my father's house. And the other one is Ephraim, which meant God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. After all that Joseph had been through, after being abandoned, sold into slavery, betrayed and estranged, he could have been bitter toward God for everything he had been through in life. But that's not how Joseph responds. Joseph chooses an attitude of gratitude, an attitude that reflects on all the good things that God has given him, all the blessings that he has received despite his external struggles. And why? Because Joseph remained focused on God. And when he has the opportunity to name his sons, a name that whenever is spoken declares something, he names his son in declaration that God has taken the pain and suffering away and has blessed him richly with mercy. So every single time Manasseh or Ephraim was mentioned, God was praised. Because Joseph didn't allow for his external struggles the pain and the hurt that he went through to define his attitude of gratitude. His attitude was defined on the blessings that God had given him despite his struggles. In 1967, at the age of 17, a girl named Joni Erickson Tada was injured in a diving accident that left her a quadriplegic without the use of her hands. During her rehabilitation, she spent several long months learning how to paint between, with a uh, paintbrush between her teeth. Today, her fine art paintings and prints are sought after. She's written over 40 books. Um, she's recorded several musical albums, has starred in an autobiographical movie on her life, and is an advocate for people with disabilities. Her life has been hard. But if there's anything that Joni personifies, it's joy. She states today, look, look around you. Surely there are small blessings, little joys, tiny hints of God's favor for which you can be grateful. Do not take today for granted. Take them with gratitude. As we wrap up this morning, I want to ask you, are you allowing the pain and the hurt in your life to define your attitude of gratitude? Is the, the way you've thought of gratitude in your life based upon the events that take place in your life? Because as Joseph and Joni and Jesus all went through life with joy, with thankfulness, with an attitude of gratitude, despite the immense amount of pain and suffering that they were endure, would endure, but because they were focused on God, on his blessings, on his goodness, and his promises. And the only way that we will ever have joy the only way that we will ever have this attitude of gratitude in all circumstances is by not letting the uh, events we go through define who we are, but by remaining focused on the cross and the hope that comes from within. As we move into a time of communion this morning, I want to encourage you to spend this time reflecting on the hope to take this time to reflect on all the blessings that God has given you, all the goodness he has shown you in your life. Spend this time trying to shift your mind away from the events that take place and toward God. 
And I hope this time that we spend in communion is only a fraction of our gratitude in our daily lives where we constantly give thanks to God for everything we have, that we don't allow for the events that take place to affect our attitude of gratitude. Let us pray.